Good morning, everyone. We'll just give a minute or two for people to join. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Good morning and welcome to today's webinar. I'm Carly Batten, Director of Marketing and Strategy for Clean Capital. Clean Capital is an industry leading clean energy investment platform focused on driving investment into middle market solar and energy storage. To date, we've invested nearly a billion dollars in 300 projects around the country. Thanks for being our guest this morning. The U.S. Department of Commerce recently opened an investigation into whether solar cell and module manufacturers are circumventing U.S. import tariffs on Chinese solar products. The potential impact of these tariffs, as many of you know, can significantly impact solar and storage developers' pipelines. We're joined today by Solar Energy Industry Association President Abigail Ross Hopper to help us understand the current situation and actions that we can each take to help to bring about a positive outcome. A couple of notes before we begin. Um, first, please feel free to ask questions using the Q&A function on the bottom of your screen throughout today's conversation. We'll leave some time at the end to answer those questions. Please also note that this webinar is being recorded and will be rebroadcast as an episode of the Experts Only podcast. Check out more conversations with leaders in clean energy, innovation, finance, and climate on, you, via the Experts Only podcast on your favorite podcasting platform. With that, I'll turn it over to my colleague and your host today, Clean Capital President and Co-Founder, John Powers. Thanks, Carly, and welcome, Abby, and welcome everyone to, to our uh, webinar today. First of all, thanks clearly for joining. There's been a tremendous amount of interest in this topic. We had over, over 250 RSVPs to this conversation. I'm going to make a quick introduction and introduce Abby as we, we dive into the, the, the conversation. So in 2021, the US solar market installed over almost 24 gigawatts of solar capacity, which is about a 19% increase since 2020. So solar accounted for 46% of all new electric generating capacity in the US in 2021. That's the third year in a row, solar has made up the largest share. So clearly our market, the things that we care about our industry continues to grow and scale. And there's been a, a push to drive domestic manufacturing through levels like direct pay, for instance, policymakers are trying to push for our industry to manufacture more here, here in the, the US. But just to be clear, according to Wood McKenzie, you know, we currently manufacture about 7.5 gigawatts of PVs uh, annually with a global capacity of nearly 400 gigawatts. So nearly, you know, clearly our domestic manufacturing is not yet where we need it to be to meet the demand of what we're, we're doing. And, and this tariff issue, which we'll talk about here in a second, is gonna really continue to drive challenges to, to our projects uh, if we're expected to be able to tap into that, that manufacturing. So as, as Carly pointed out, the US Department of Commerce opened an investigation into whether solar cells and module manufacturers are circumventing, circumventing these tariffs uh, and having projects shipped or panels shipped from places like Cambodia, Vietnam, Thailand, Malaysia. And the potential of this tariff, which we'll talk more about, can really go retroactively back to 2021 to affect projects in the last year. What we're really allowing to happen is a $10 million, 150 megawatt capacity company like Oxen is really petitioning to shut down our $10 billion industry. Um, my hope is today's conversation with Abby will help us better understand the challenges, the challenges many of us face and investing or building projects and will help drive all of us to some action to support the work that Abby and her team are doing. So 
folks that don't know Abby, she's the president and CEO of the Solar Energy Industry Association. You should all be members. And if you're not, you need to sign up today to be members. Uh, I'm going to make your sales pitch for you, Abby, because this is the, the work she's doing is critical. Abby's got a really tremendous uh, and distinguished career, both in the public and private sector, uh, before she took the helm at SIA. And over the last several years, has really helped guide our industry as it grown, has grown uh, and wrestle with some of the incredible challenges that we have faced. So, Abby, thank you so much for joining us. John, it's so good to be here. Um, it's not great to talk about tariffs again, but it's really good to see your face. And um, I loved what you led with, right? The, all the ways in which our industry has been growing year over year, increases all sectors of the market, like all sizes of company. Um, but obviously we have a pretty big significant um, challenge ahead of us and we'll, we'll talk all about that. But I do wanna, I wanna thank you for the work you've done in the industry. You are clearly, a leader, both in terms of the work you do as companies, but also the a leading voice on policy. And I think it's so important for companies to really appreciate how policy impacts their bottom line, right? Like you and I don't care about policy simply because we're policy geeks. We care about it because it impacts the bottom line and the profitability of our companies. And that's why everyone listening and watching this should get involved because it's going to impact you know, your, your, your revenue and your end of your bonus, yeah. and how many people you can employ. And so it's really, it's really critically important. So thanks for providing this forum to chat about it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's really important for folks to know that their voices, you don't have to be in Washington to lend your voice to this fight. And we'll talk more about this later, but it's actually more powerful when you're talking about local jobs and what the app, what these tariffs are going to do to potential projects in, in the community of those lawmakers that we're going to want to talk to and leaders we want to talk to. So Abby, just to step back and just really set the stage for folks that aren't aware, just talk for a second about uh, what the Solar Energy Industry Association and your role in this fight. Sure. So the I always say we are um, your trade association, right? So if you are in the solar and the solar and storage industry, uh, we are your voice in Washington, at the RTOs, in the state capitals, at the state regulatory agencies. And so whether or not you are a member of SIA, and I, I would very much encourage you to be a member of SIA because you will get a lot of benefits from that. Um, we are the ones going into the courtroom, going into the legislature, going into offices and saying, hey, this is what the industry needs to provide business certainty and allow capital to flow. Simple as that. So we do that in a variety of ways and we can talk about all that. But for this particular fight, and we'll, we'll talk about sort of the contours of this case, we are really leading the fight with, um, and it feels like a fight, I'm <laughs> really leading the fight um, to let the White House know, let the Congress know, and let the Department of Commerce know what's really at risk, right? The number of jobs, the impact on capital, um, the projects deployed, the goals, the ability to meet the president's climate goals. All of that is at risk. And so that's that's literally what I'm doing on a daily basis is sharing that message for all of the companies. Yeah. In for, for those of us that are, you know, I think working day in and day out trying to build projects on the ground, you know, this audience is made up of uh, of mostly developers across the country. You know, can you just step back and you know, most of us aren't as close to Washington as you are or follow policy like you and I do, just walk through the the, the, the little background here and, and what has sort of driven us to where we are today around this investigation? Yeah, no, it's a really, it's important to sort of understand the context, as you said. And so for those of you that, um, I mean, that's the beauty of a trade association is you don't have to follow it as closely as I do. And you don't have to come to Washington. I live here, right? I actually grew up here. I'm one of those people that actually grew up here. <laughs> um, but you're welcome to come anytime and you have a home here in our office. Um, but what has happened is that, a, as John said, a small company based out of San Jose, California, um, that, that has a very limited ability to produce uh, solar panels, filed a petition with the United States Department of Commerce. And in that petition, com that company, Oxen Solar, alleged that the U.S. trade laws were being circumvented. So sometimes it's called the circumvention petition. The US trade laws were being circumvented and that while there have long been for about a decade tariffs on um, cells and modules coming out of China directly, that, that companies have circumvented those tariffs by building manufacturing facilities in those four countries you named, Malaysia, Thailand, Cambodia, and Vietnam. And that um, because they're circumventing 
our trade laws that there should be tariffs imposed on cells and modules coming from those four countries. That, I mean, we'll talk a lot about the impact of that, but just to give you some context, the vast majority of um, solar PV cells and modules coming into the United States are coming from those four countries. So this is not sort of a niche, like trade law geeky issue. This is an issue that affects literally every developer in the US, regardless of where you source your, your modules from, because as you know, as supply decreases, prices increase. So even if you have the best supply from a country that's not impacted, you're going to be you you will feel the effects. So that's what's happening. Then um, the U.S. Department of Commerce on April 1st said, you know what, we think there's enough here to investigate. And so that's what's happening. We're in this period of investigation right now. Um, there's a time period by which they have to make a preliminary determination of whether or not the U.S. trade laws have been circumvented or violated. Um, they have 150 days to make that decision. We are pushing them hard to make that much more quickly to give you some certainty. Um, and then they have the rest of the year, literally, to make a final determination. And so whether, you know, what the determination is, what the impact of that determination is, how far back they go retroactively to impose tariffs on things that, uh, that are already here in the United States, we can talk about all of that. But you can see that this has far-ranging consequences. Yeah, absolutely. I think we're seeing it uh, across the industry today. So yeah. to move from policy to politics for a second, you know, this, as you mentioned, flies in the face of all the uh, progressive agenda we're seeing moving climate and clean energy uh, within the Biden administration right now. Uh, is there any color you can add to the politics behind this, like what drove this, or is that something people are just trying to figure out? All of the above. Yeah. <laughs> I will happily share what I know and the kind of conversations that I've been having. But I, I mean, you're right. The, the day that this decision was made by the United States Department of Commerce, whose obviously secretary was chosen by President Biden and was charged, like all of the secretaries, to reach the, the president's um, goals and priorities, of which climate, addressing the climate crisis is, um, you know, in the top four. That's what he keeps going in of four issues, and climate was one of them. Yeah. Uh, so on the same day that that investigation was announced, the budget, the 20 fiscal year 23 budget was announced that had all of this incredible stuff for climate, right? And so it's this, we find ourselves in this very odd juxtaposition of uh, um, administration that is absolutely saying all the right things and in some ways really delivering on promises and yet um, has presented the biggest challenge that we've seen. Um, some of you have been here way longer than I have. And I will say the people on my staff that have been here for 10, 15 years have all to a person said, this is the biggest risk. This is the biggest um, crisis they've witnessed. We're famous for our solar coaster. Um, yeah. I think some of us take pride <laughs> that we can ride the solar coaster, but this, this feels like, uh, you know, we're about to crash. It's not, it's not sort of a yeah. fun and exciting ride anymore. It, it feels like we're headed straight towards a brick wall. Uh, that's an interesting perspective. I, I, some other time, I'll talk to you more about the politics behind this. I feel like friends in the White House were seem uh, were were shocked when this came out. Like, I think a lot of folks were caught off guard by the fact that this was uh, unveiled. And is, for folks that aren't don't know Washington, the president's budget is a major policy uh, driver, and you know there was a lot of thought and, and effort put behind it, and literally it was undercut the same day by you know by the investigation. So, so I want to. Step back. You talked about some of the things you're hearing. You know, a lot, a lot of the folks on this call witness firsthand the impacts that this is having on their projects, their pipeline, not being able to get access to panels or trying to find out where they're stored here in the U.S. What are you hearing from your members on the effects that this is having on their both short and long term uh, projects? Yeah, we have so the the first thing we did was just go out to both members and non-members and say, hey, we've created this survey tool, fill out the survey, tell us what you're seeing, tell us whether your panel supply is impacted, tell us whether your pipeline is impacted, your project, your, your workforce. And so over 700 companies have responded, which I'm not a statistician, I'm a lawyer, but that's a pretty good sample size. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> for, um, for a survey. And so 
I mean, it was heartbreaking, John, like, because, th th you know, there's, there's places where you fill in numbers, but then there's a block for um, companies to really share a narrative around what's happening. And it's, it's brutal out there. And I, um, so I really feel for companies that are facing really, really horrible choices. Um, but what the data tells us is that, you know, we are at risk of cutting our deployment in half literally cutting our deployment in half over the next two years, um, putting the industry back almost a decade, right? In terms of how many people we're employing, how many projects we're deploying. Um, it, is, it is almost, I almost feel like I'm exaggerating, right? It's sort of hard to imagine that I'm sitting here. I literally can see the White House out my window and I have a democratic president, a democratic Senate and a democratic house. And I'm telling you that we are at risk of our industry being cut in half. And it, I feel like I'm in some other reality, some right. not augmented, but alternate reality, but unfortunately I'm not. And so the vast majority of our companies um, have already seen their, their module supply either um, threatened, you know, delayed or, or just canceled. Um, and what we are seeing is that, and we're gonna release more data later today and tomorrow morning, but what we're seeing is that some companies that originally thought they were going to be okay are realizing they're not, right? Because as we said, if there's only, you know, 20% of the supply available, well, the price just went up and your contract might not be quite as um, bulletproof as you thought it was, right? Companies are willing to pay liquidated damages if they can get a much higher price. Um, we've had lots of companies tell us that they have basically built, um, <laughs> they talked about almost building like vineyards, right? Like all the racking is up, but there's no panel. Right. right? So it almost looks like a winery or they have half of the panels. And so they have half of the project built, but they don't know when they're going to get the other half of the panels. And so they obviously can't energize or finish it. We have, um, you know, things that, ha that have been contracted for, but not built yet. And now they're trying to figure out how do you price in their tariff risk, right? And do you go back to the customer and say, hey, um, so it may be 250% more, it may not be, but who's going to take that risk, right? And you know, I mean, you're a businessman. Yeah. That's not a risk that really- We're having those conversations right now. Yeah. Yeah, you you're in them. So it's, um, it is a really challenging situation. I think the thing that um, maybe surprised everybody was how quickly it happened. What's today? April 26th, right? It's just, this decision was just made on April 1st. So we are three and a half weeks in and we're already seeing the impact of it um, so quickly because the, the, the risk is just so high that it's, right. hard to, um, it's hard to contract around that risk. Hard to contract, how to finance, how to model all these different changes. And so just to point out for the folks that aren't members of SEA, you can go to SEA.org and, and sign up to be, to be a member to get access to that survey. A lot of great information is coming out regularly right now from the SEA team on this. Um, you know, one of the things I'd be interested, you know, I'm going to go to one of the questions online. If you have questions, please enter them in the Q&A chat. Uh, someone pointed to a specific comment from uh, one of the CEOs in the industry, but really, I think what it points to is that the, the, the fact that this is actually now forcing companies to go directly to China to source these projects versus the countries they're talking about. Is there any recognition of that in the Department of Commerce that this is sort of counterintuitive to all the policies that they're moving, trying to move forward in the administration? We have certainly been carrying that message to, um, to the White House, to the Department of Commerce, to the Department of Energy. Um, Wood McKenzie, uh, I think you mentioned a study they did, and it, it, one of the findings was exactly what your listener or your viewer pointed to, is that it will quickly become apparent that the best source of panels is from China. And we have the data to, to support that. And I think, you know, I think you had, my sense is the administration finds itself in a bit of a bind, right? Like, ooh, not really sure what to do. I saw someone yeah. asked about legislation and, you know, in my mind, there is a solution set here, but it does require legislation. And so the, the, these two things are, are absolutely intricately linked. Um, and, you, you know, you're a Washington guy, you know, yeah. you know the challenges we're having <laughs> on the other side of the house here. <laughs> yeah. 
So Abby, with that, before we get into the solutions for a second, look, what are the, like, what's the actual decision? I mean, the investigation is happening. There will be a decision point by commerce in, you know, uh, in maybe January that says we're going to install X tariff because this is happening. Like what's, what is the yeah. actual decision being yeah. discussed? Here's the timeline. So the, the initial case was filed, the officially filed April, the decision to investigate April 1. So 150 days from April 1, so late August, I think it's August 30th, but I might be a day or one or two days off. But by August 30th of this year, 2022, the Department of Commerce has to make a preliminary determination. And that preliminary determination will be either a positive or negative. Positive preliminary determination means, yeah, we think that there is a case there. We think there has been circumvention, but we need to do a little bit more investigating. A negative determination means, nope, we don't think there is, and we're gonna finish, we're gonna finish the investigation and make a final determination. We asked our lawyers to sort of look at the history of these cases, and it is the vast, vast majority of cases, what happens at the preliminary stage is what happens at the final stage. So that initial finding is really key. Yeah. Um, the 150 days is what the statute allows the Department of Commerce to take. As you could imagine, as I said, we have been pushing them to move much more quickly. Um, we are really targeting 60 days as, um, as the time by which they should be acting. Um, you know, they can, they don't have to listen to us. Um, our, yeah, our job is to show them that, you know, every day that they, they leave this industry in crisis and in uncertainty, they're harming jobs. They're like jobs, they're, people are getting laid off, right? There's a human cost to this indecision. Um, and so, but that's the timeline. The preliminary determination is then another like um, uh, six or seven months after that for the final determination. So if they, if they take the whole time for a preliminary and then they take the whole time for a final it's about a year about a year wow. so we'll be april of 2023 before we have a final determination and um and as we said like the the range of tariffs is, is pretty broad 50 percent to 250 percent how they apply the tariff whether they're countrywide tariffs where they are um, company-wide tariffs company specific tariffs that's all uncertain um, companies, some companies don't have tariffs already established through the existing case. I mean, it, you can tell it gets really technical really quickly. And so I don't mean to be confusing. I only mean to sort of demonstrate the amount of uncertainty upon uncertainty that the industry is facing. Right. So um, I want to get into what folks can do about it here in a second. But just so I'm clear, like positive, negative, right? If it's a negative, if it's a negative in August, that means they've just close the case or is it that negative in August means they're going forward and it's a negative effect? <laughs> yeah. It's like so trying to figure negative, out your positive and negative COVID test. What is this? We mean? want, we want negative. We want a we negative, negative. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah, just like good. your COVID test. <laughs> yeah, negative, right, right. Negative, negative. <laughs> negative, there's nothing to see here, but it's still preliminary. And so they kind of finalize the, um, the investigation. But as I said, there's very few times when they change their opinion from negative at the preliminary to, to positive at the final. So a negative preliminary determination is really a key finding. Um, and, and, and politically, what impact can, you know, I think about something that comes out of FERC, right? The White House really has no leverage on FERC because it's an independent agency, but commerce is part of the, the executive branch. What leverage, yeah. if any, does the administration have on setting these findings? Um, I think they are viewing this, my sense from having conversations is they're viewing it more like a FERC proceeding and, the, more and independent, that is yeah. sort of a quasi-judicial determination based on the facts. Um, I mean, we, we feel very strongly that substantively we should win on this case as well. I mean, the, the, what Oxen has alleged is that the processing and the, the manufacturing process that's happening in those four countries is insignificant and minimal that's what that those are the words in the statute and so um 
if you think about, I mean, so I don't know how technical people get, but if you think about the process involved in manufacturing cells, um, it is neither insignificant nor minimal, right? right. It is a pretty, and there is data around how much of the value of the product is created in that manufacturing process, and it's more than half of the value. And so our, our trade lawyers are making those cases, right? The sub, on, the, on the merits of the petition, we think we will win. Um, and that gives me some hope <laughs> right. that this will be a short-lived nightmare and not an extended nightmare. Um, I think substantively we will win, but we're obviously we're also making very clear to the administration and to the Department of Commerce the impact that even the investigation is having. So I'm going to get into what folks can do here in a second, but I just want to break out segments for a second. A lot of folks, the developers of the call specifically, and the ones that we have relationships with, you know, really work not in utility scale uh, and really not in resi, right? They work in that middle market, whether it be CNI, distributed generation. Do you have a sense that one market's going to be impacted differently? One segment will be impacted differently than others? And then two, you know, is, is CIA getting any guidance to its members on, you know, what actions should they be taking to sort of, prepare or, um, you know, uh, uh, trying to get ahead of this, or yeah. it's hard to get ahead of it now at this point. Yeah, it's hard to get ahead of it now, unfortunately. Um, so um, we think it's going to impact all sectors of the market. I mean, as you said, and you're opening, we just don't have the domestic capacity here, right? right. So it's not right. like we can just say, okay, everyone just go buy domestic. Like you'll pay a little more, but it'll be fine. That's not the reality on the ground. And so to, um, we, uh, from the respondents, we have heard in the, in all, I mean, all of the customer classes are being impacted by this. So unfortunately, most of the developers on here will be impacted. Um, advice, I mean, one of the things I have heard is that, um, there is a concern that this may impact smaller businesses much more, much more because they don't have sort of the, some of the financial resources and, and the, the depth of balance sheet to kind of ride out this wave. Yeah. Um, you know, as we said, like every day matters, right? Every day of uncertainty matters. And so um, that's not really a, I can't solve that for people, but, right. um, but, if you haven't gotten notice from your supplier yet that your panels are, yeah. get your panels on your credit as fast as possible. <laughs> yeah. I mean, should they be, you know, driving directly to look at other countries? I mean, we're, we're having conversations with everyone, right? Trying to find panels. Like, you know, it, do you see any, um, any guidance there? I mean, people should be driving, just going directly to China now and just paying that that structure like what 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 if any guidance can you guys give there and if, if none that's understandable yeah you know um i think that companies should figure out what makes the most sense for their business there's certainly other um panel providers in other countries that aren't named in this petition what what i think some people are finding though is that they may get cells from those right the modules may be coming from a different country yeah one that's not named but the cells are coming from one of those four and so it really, it, it is really incumbent on developers and buyers to um, really focus on the supply chain. I mean, you know, if yeah. 2021 taught us, taught us nothing else, it is that understanding our supply chains is critical to our economic health, right? Like we can't totally. pretend that it just arrives on our doorstep and it, it doesn't matter where it came from. That's true. And to answer someone's question in the Q&A, it is totally frozen the supply, is frozen the panel supply chain 100%. People just don't know who to buy from or what to do right now. And it's been uh, wildly frustrating. So let's talk about what we can do to take action to help you all, whether it be, you know, folks have talked about relationships they have with members. Should we be pushing, you know, within the, if, if there's going to be climate legislation uh, to have some solution? Um, well, first, maybe let me start off with that. Is there, it seems like there is a possibility of some climate focused legislation that include things like the ITC extension. So that is definitely on the table right now. Could this be included in that? So I agree with you that it's definitely on the table. Um, what we see as 
you know, we, you talked about domestic manufacturing and how critically important that is. And there are provisions in, in the piece of legislation that passed out of the House that, that um, help domestic manufacturing. And so that's critical. Um, we're also looking at kind of regulatory ways to, it's, it can, we can't solve this petition. Like this petition yeah. is, is that, that we're already on the tracks, but the next one, right? Like we cannot continue to go like uh, segment of the market by segment of the market to try to try to stop the growth of the solar industry. Like I am a, this is just my personal opinion, right? Yeah. I reminded my team yesterday, the reason why it feels like we are under siege and in fact we are under siege is because we're winning, right? And like all the numbers right. you just said at the beginning, people like opponents do not put targets on losers, right? They put them on the folks right. that are threatening. Not going to spend their time. All right. Right. And so the solar industry is clearly threatening and you can fill in the blanks about who we're threatening. Um, but every, even with this blip, this significant blip, every chart, every trajectory shows us growing and growing and taking market share from established market participants. And so I am definitely focused on one company called Oxen, but I am more focused on how do we de-risk our, like the whole issue of domestic manufacturing so that as an industry, we don't have to keep having the same battle over and over and over again. Yeah. And I think um, probably the most likely way to try to do that is through a regulatory fix and we're hard at work on that. Um, I'm not looking right now at legislation to fix that. I am looking at legislation to really help incent a domestic manufacturing space. Can the administration just eliminate the tariffs? Would that just stop this? If what? I'm sorry? Can they eliminate just the tariffs that are in place in general, like the, the Trump tariffs, for instance? Would that, they can yeah, do that, that and that would just great. end this? That would yeah. be great. That would be ideal. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just get making sure that was an option. Get be. rid of the, like, you know, 232s, get rid of the, I mean, the amount of information I know about trade law now, which I did not know right. when I got here. <laughs> 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 We just want to solve climate change, yeah, but we don't want to talk trade law. <laughs> um, I thought I was coming here to do. <laughs> right. So you've got a lot of developers in the line that have that are that are developing projects in states that are paused. What should could they be doing? Should they reach out to commerce? Should they reach out to their members? Should they call the White House? Like, what do you need them to do, and how can they do it? Yes. So I will echo what you said that the developers on the line are the best voices, right? You are the ones in the communities, employing people in your neighborhoods, spending money at vendors, like providing tax base to local communities. And so your voice is unique and incredibly important. Um, we are spending time lobbying, that's not a dirty word, telling your story. It's not a dirty to, word. No, I mean, it's how it works. Um, telling your story to both members of Congress and to the White House, and to the Department of Commerce. And the best way to do that, and, and honestly, whether I would encourage you to become a CM member, but whether you're a CM member or not, all of these resources are available to you. There are sort of form sample letters, um, ways to engage with your members of Congress, ways to engage with the White House and Department of Commerce. It is all on our website, a whole like sort of media toolkit and advocacy toolkit because we need to hear all those voices. I'm here, as I said, I'm in Washington. I have 50 CEOs flying in tomorrow to head to the Hill, like in person for the first time since I've been on the Hill, but I haven't taken a group of CEOs to the Hill since March of 2020, wow. um, to tell Congress how truly devastating this is. There will be other opportunities to do that. And I would encourage people to engage. Um, one, This is sort of a side note. One of the things that happened with happened during the COVID crisis was that um, electeds got really comfortable doing Zoom advocacy meetings. And so right. you don't have to necessarily fly to Washington, right? We'd love to see you, but you can be in Indiana or you can be in Ohio or you can be in Georgia or you can be in Arizona and we'll get a call together and you can lobby that way. It is, um, so like I hear, the, hear what I'm, the invitation I'm extending and don't automatically count yourself out. Like we will find a way for you and facilitate telling your story. And and the, it's the yeah. I was talking to a member yesterday, and I was like, "Listen, Troy, like you know, it's one thing to say we're going to lose half of our jobs, 
we're gonna, you know, deployment could be cut by 40, fill in the blank of gigawatts. Like, okay, okay, okay. And then they go to their next meeting. But if you say like, hey, you know, I employ um, Colleen, I'm looking at Colleen's name on the screen. I'm, I employ <laughs> Colleen and she, you know, I had to lay her off last week, right? She joined solar industry. She came from construction. Um, and this was the path to the future for her and her family. And I had to lay her off. And so Colleen doesn't know what she's going to do now. Like those vignettes, and you know, John, those vignettes yeah. stick. And so to the extent that, that companies on the phone and developers on the phone can think about their experiences and share those kind of personal stories, that makes all the difference. So two things. One, we are going to email out to everyone on this call so links to those SIA uh, resources so you guys can figure out how to tap into your social media or push. The other thing, I'm just going to challenge all of us to think about, it doesn't really matter where you're sitting. You know, we're, I'm sitting here in Buffalo, Abbey's in Washington, but it's really also where your projects are. If we have yeah. projects in Maine that are being delayed, we have projects in Illinois or, or wherever, think about where those projects are. And then SIA can help you navigate to the right member that that will matter to because they're going to really care if so much economic development is not happening in their area because uh, of this and help tell those stories. Um, well, look, some great questions in the Q and A, you know, we'll try to follow up with these separately and capture them and share them with um, the team at, uh, at SIA in case there's specific things, but in short, this is affecting all types of projects, not just solar. It's also affecting solar plus storage. Uh, and for folks that do follow storage separately, Granted, this isn't affecting it, but the supply chains are significantly being affected right now in storage and causing some challenges. Um, just you know, to elaborate for a second, Abby, as we sort of step back and look at the, the rest of this year, you know, there's, there is real potential here for something like a climate bill uh, mm -hmm. that could include the ITC, maybe solutions to this. Like what is, what is you know, leading into, um, used to be called Solar Power International, now it's called RE Plus in Anaheim in, in September. Like what, what do you want from your, your, the folks on this phone to make sure that we have a successful 2022 and, uh, and beyond? Yeah. Um, I think folks need to, just like you're going to tell your story about the impact that the auction petition is having, um, also telling about the opportunity, right? We don't always have to tell a story of, of desperation, but really of opportunity right. and of growth. Um, and, you know, hey, if the ITC extension gets passed, and I have a 10 year runway, I'm gonna hire 2,500, 1,000 more people. Um, I'm gonna hire them in Ohio and in Nevada and in Illinois. I don't know, I'm making stuff up. Um, that's a really powerful story as well. And I think um, companies uh, or legislators really need to hear that. Um, but I do think like, I just came back uh, from Texas. We had RE plus Texas last week and we haven't been able to gather in person in so long. And there is something really magical about being together and we're having crazy attendance, like great crazy attendance at our events. I think because people are just hungry for, for yeah. that, um, uh, for, to be with their colleagues. So come to RE Plus Anaheim because, you know, there is something magic that happens when we all gather Not just together. Disneyland. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> 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 um, I know it's so funny there, um, but there is, you know, we invite a lot of legislators to that, a lot of policymakers, and we walk them around the show floor because it, it helps them to understand that this is like last year, we were a $33 billion industry, right? There's 230,000 people employed in this industry, right? This is not a niche product. This is not right. like some sort of science experiment. This is the, how the future of our economy, um, and so I really encourage people to kind of embrace that and, and embrace that uh, I'm not, I'm not, I'm sort of over the fights between like our, uh, you know, fossil versus renewable and wind versus solar. Like, I'm not talking about that anymore. I'm talking about the fact that we're going to take the market share and we're going to win. Like, and so let me show you how we're going to win. So take that yeah. message as well. <laughs> I uh, know that Abby, that's great. And, and, you know, a lot of great questions on what folks can be doing. We'll, we'll make sure we engage and, and, and answer those separately. Uh, as always, you can go to SIA.org to learn more and connect with the team there. Uh, and you can, uh, as Carly mentioned, this is being recorded as an episode of Experts Only. You can get more episodes of Experts Only at cleancapital.com. 
Abby, thank you so much for being a part of this conversation and helping to get folks, drive folks to some action and, you know, God bless you on this challenge ahead and let us know how we can help continue to uh, get this resolved. Thank you, John, for bringing this um, to your viewers and your listeners, and we appreciate your partnership as always. Absolutely. Thanks, everyone, for joining, and uh, we'll definitely follow back up with more information. Have a great day. Have a great day.